uh, we got an hour now it's already 12 20 probably 45 minutes okay so we've got three case scenarios where uh, we are trying to put things across one as i said is someone with a recurrent entity then with a uh, skeletal dysplasia and then we got a baby with thalassemia we got a couple of cases for each of these scenarios and uh, we'll see how we approach this uh, from both the ultrasound perspective or the fetal medicine perspective and from the geneticist perspective so that we can give the proper counseling to the parents in the subsequent pregnancy so we'll move on to case 1 uh, this was a patient who came to us in the third pregnancy at around uh, uh, 28 29 weeks uh, her first baby 2010 it was a female baby 2.3 kg normal delivery Uh, when we took the history we found that uh, this baby had uh, segmentation abnormalities in the lower thoracolumbar region and the baby had a diastomatomyelia and uh, this baby underwent surgery at 1 uh, year and 8 months to remove the bony spur and a detethering of the cord uh, baby is now around 3 uh, the at around 2 years and 5 months of age the uh, second surgery was done baby is around 7 uh, years old baby is able to walk in serving activities uh, with less some amount of morbidity second pregnancy was a miscarriage and she came she came to us for a third pregnancy uh, as i said in third uh, in late second trimester and these were the ultrasound findings uh, we found that the baby in the head of the baby you can see the classical uh, banana sign you have with the uh, sign of adrenal carry malformation and on the vaginal scan you can see the open neural tube defect and the vertebral abnormalities and an open spine so basically this time this baby had an open neural tube defect in the prior pregnancy she had had a baby with a, a closed neural tube defect and now uh, we had an open neural tube defect and this is the uh, image of the uh, baby and you can see the open neural tube defect there so uh, once we see such a patient and uh, this patient needs to uh, have a counseling prior to planning any subsequent pregnancy uh, i would like dr sujatha to give her thoughts on the same see first of all uh, isolated uh, neural tube defect is uh, having a multifactorial inheritance so uh, isolated neural tube defects can ha- can be because of uh, nutritional deficiency because of folic acid or b12 so we have to in the history find out whether she was adequately supplemented and then uh, we need to uh, find out if the mother had uh, gestational diabetes or diabetes complicating pregnancy because that is the single most important teratogen which can produce neural tube defect and that to a recurrent neural tube defect and also we need to examine the parents because one of the parent can have a tuft of hair or a neural tube defect and they may have the risk of passing on to the next pregnancy so these are uh, three important things which we need to see and especially when you see a neural tube defect on the scan and then you terminate a pregnancy it is very vital that you subject the fetus for autopsy because in the scan you may not find out all the findings of the new baby and so uh, just identifying neural tube defect in the scan we may not be able to offer accurate counseling so that's why it is important to look at the autopsy and find out that there are no other defects in the baby and it is isolated neural tube defect and if there is a closed neural tube defect in one pregnancy it can happen a recurrence can happen as an open neural tube defect in the next pregnancy and if it is a cervical encephalocele it can present as a lumbar meningomyelocele in the next pregnancy so that can vary from pregnancy to pregnancy so we have to ensure that the mother is adequately supplemented with folic acid and b12 because b12 deficiency is also a, a considerable deficiency which we have seen as a contributory factor to neural tube defects so adequate supplementation ruling out maternal diabetes and examining the parents are three important factors which we have to see before we uh, counsel the mother for the next pregnancy right so uh, we'll move on to our second case this was mrs h and she was referred for uh, uh, pre pregnancy counseling at that point of time for a recurrent congenital anomaly and uh, on reviewing on history this was a history that was there long history fourth degree congenital couple married 10 years uh, first Uh, pregnancy ninth month ultrasound revealed a cardiac abnormality baby was still born male at term second 9 year old boy and alive and healthy third pregnancy terminated at 5 months in view of the report said query anomaly query ntd and the requisition mentions it as a recurrent ntd and the fourth one pregnancy again terminated at 5 months in view of anomaly the report again said query ntd nothing else was there so this is the scenario with which this patient came to us in the pre pregnancy period and they met our geneticist there and uh, then we went on see this is a fourth degree consanguineous couple so there is a degree history of consanguinity and there is a history of uh, first pregnancy we do not know 
probably they say it's a cardiac abnormality but then there is no scan report with the patient no autopsy has been done and they have a normal male uh, name normal baby in between and then again two pregnancies subsequently have been terminated with a probable diagnosis of ntd again there is no scan picture to uh, review and there is no autopsy so we really do not know what happened to those babies because it is a consanguineous marriage probably there is a risk of some single gene disorder running in the family so but then we can't go and do any tests at this point of time because we don't have evidence for anything so the routine uh, counseling for neural tube defect has to be given like ruling out maternal diabetes supplementing with folic acid and b12 but ask her to come for an early pregnancy scan as early as 11 to 12 weeks because if it is a severe problem which can be picked up early in pregnancy we can and then do some diagnostic tests if it is necessary yeah so this was a counseling that was given and she was supplemented on b12 folic acid her sugars were normal and uh, she was advised to come to us for a subsequent pregnancy at the 12th week and she came to us in her fifth pregnancy at 12 weeks and these were the ultrasound findings at the 12th week scan what did the baby have the baby again had a neural tube defect the baby had a large occipital cephalocele but ultrasound revealed other additional findings as i said baby had polydactyly uh, this is a 12 week transvaginal scan uh, rendering image baby had polydactyly of both hands polydactyly of the feet uh, the baby also had uh, mesomelia of the lower limbs the mid segment was short and the baby also had a complex cardiac abnormality but the other classical finding that the baby had was which i showed you earlier both kidneys were enlarged with lot of cyst in them so with this picture of an occipital cephalocele polydactyly and a cystic dysplastic kidney we have this triad which uh, suspects meckel gruber syndrome which is one of the earliest ultrasound detected abnormalities at the 12th week scan uh, so we now uh, had an idea we had a thought that probably the, the ntds that they were referring to earlier were not actually simple ntds but they were actually uh, a meckel gruber syndrome which were probably recurring in subsequent pregnancies but anyway to confirm the problem we asked them to send the baby for autopsy and the babies were sent for autopsy so any uh, problem in the ultrasound when you detect multiple congenital anomalies it is always good practice to look at the uh, autopsy because autopsy one confirms whatever we saw on the ultrasound and second gives additional information which may narrow down the clinical diagnosis but in this case it was quite obvious that all the findings that were seen in the ultrasound were confirmed there was microcephaly and occipital encephalocele there were large cystic dysplastic kidneys there was post axial post axial polydactyly so the most probable diagnosis in this pregnancy was meckel gruber syndrome it is quite common uh, commonly seen in our uh, population and because there has been a recurrence and it is a consanguineous marriage so most probably it is autosomal recessive and there is 25% recurrence in subsequent pregnancies so now this is a, a group of condition called celiopathy where you have other syndromes also related like bardet beidel goldston syndrome so they have a lot of clinical overlap and they are all a group of celiopathies but meckel gruber per se is caused by several genes so either we have to test one by one or we have to go for a panel testing but then this is a condition which presents quite early in pregnancy so uh, we can do away with uh, molecular testing and then ask her to come early in pregnancy because this is detectable early in pregnancy that is one thing and there are certain parents who don't want to go in for termination again and again and because it is an autosomal recessive condition then we have to confirm that it is meckel gruber syndrome by molecular testing because if we want to give them alternative reproductive options then we have to confirm it by molecular testing and find out the pattern of inheritance for sure so that they can go for uh, either a donor embryo or a donor sperm in the next pregnancy to avoid such a problem in the next pregnancy if they don't want terminations in the next pregnancy yes so key message uh, uh, meckel these kind of entities have an early pre early presentation on ultrasound so always ref, uh, get them back for an early pregnancy scan around 12 weeks and make sure that you confirm the diagnosis on autopsy so this was a slightly different case this was a third case mrs v she was referred for a second opinion ultrasound at 32 to 33 weeks she was a diabetic on insulin so we got one risk factor and she was referred as a fetus with ntd this was the referral form and what we found was the baby had multiple uh, vertebral abnormalities and you can see it both in the 3d rendered image and on the sagittal image that you can see and the baby also had a sacral dysgenesis so multiple vertebral anomalies sacral dysgenesis 
a diagnosis of a closed neural tube defect was given and uh, they didn't come back to us for a follow up basically uh, that baby uh, was the <coughs> was delivered and uh, uh, that baby the follow up was not brought to us so in the second pregnancy she came to us and then uh, again diabetic and this pregnancy serial follow up was done and she delivered an alive male child baby was fine and so because we gave her a completely follow up completely followed up on the outcomes were good she decided to come back to us for a third pregnancy again for a follow up scan and this time she came to us at the 12th to 13th week because we reiterated that you need to come back to us from early pregnancy scans because of the prior problem and at the 13th week scan this time uh, these were the ultrasound findings and what did we see uh, the intracranial lucency i'll tell that about that little later in my next talk was normal so the baby did not have an open neural tube defect but definitely there was an abnormality in the vertebral bodies very irregular vertebral bodies uh, very difficult to see in the abdominal scan uh, but the vaginal scan gave us a clue because any time we see we suspect a baby with prior problem we uh, very uh, do we do transvaginal scan uh, for all these patients definitely because it gives us more information so ultrasound showed an abnormal vertebrae with angulation at the lower thoracic and the lumbar spine and uh, so we sent them to the genetics because now she had a first baby with a, a, a neural tube defect and again a, a baby with a possible neural tube defect so we sent them to the genetics for counseling and uh, then i'll take it to dr sujatha so uh, whenever there is a baby who is uh, born and then has a problem we need to go and peruse the records so when we when we were referred with this patient i asked for the details of the first baby and they did have the photograph of the baby and you can see that the baby has a very short chest and the back photograph was not available but then they had x rays next uh, this was the neonatal course and you can see the show the x rays and you can see that the uh, multiple segmentation abnormalities and also the rib abnormalities are there so the ribs are fewer in number and there is some fusion abnormalities in the ribs so this is a very typical case of uh, Uh, jarko levin syndrome which is a spondylocostal dysostosis this is again an autosomal recessive condition and there is 25% recurrence in every pregnancy next so uh, in view of uh, recurrence we did a prenatal diagnosis we stored the fetal dna in this pregnancy and the pregnancy was terminated at 13 weeks the fetus was sent for an autopsy and these are the uh, gross findings you can see you don't have any open defect there that is seen and uh, this is the x ray and uh, because uh, this is a smaller fetus the mineralization is not very optimal as you see in the earlier x ray but still definitely you can make out the segmentation defects in the x ray so uh, any uh, problem in the vertebra it is the best modality of investigation is taking a radiograph because you can analyze the vertebral bodies completely and then this particular abnormality is called jarko levin syndrome and there will be a complete dissegmentation of the vertebra from the thorax to the uh, lumbar vertebra and there will be rib abnormalities and we call this as a classical crab chest deformity where there are uh, reduction in the number of the ribs and fusion abnormalities in the ribs and this is a specific genetic entity and these fetuses can also present with open neural tube defect so when a fetus presents with open neural tube defect and has all these segmentation defects then the recurrence in the next pregnancy is going to be 25% and not the usual 3 to 5% which we quote for our regular neural tube defect so that's why we need to do an autopsy take an x ray and study the anatomy of the vertebra and the ribs before we offer counseling in the subsequent pregnancy and as usual the spondylocostal dysostosis has uh, several genes <coughs> and the most common causing uh, spondylocostal dysostosis is the dll3 gene but then this has to go for uh, gene by gene sequencing or some panels for us to confirm the diagnosis so uh, the key messages when you see babies with uh, mothers with uh, recurrent ntds uh, you look for the mother you look for diabetes you supplement folic acid b12 most important try to come to a complete diagnosis in the previous pregnancy and always get them and start evaluating them from the early pregnancy scan with respect to scans as they showed in this case where the baby had not only vertebral abnormalities but rib abnormalities identifying these rib abnormalities is very difficult on prenatal scans uh, at 12 weeks it's almost impossible 
at 20 weeks it may be possible in some yes so most important thing is to have radiographs of the baby after delivery uh, even if the parents uh, are not willing for a complete autopsy or if you don't have a facility where a complete uh, autopsy is feasible ask them to take clinical photographs and x-ray is definitely possible so that this information can help you in counseling them during the subsequent pregnancy planning and always get them back for a 12 week scan and subsequent pregnancies so we'll move on to the next group of scenarios uh, this was a 27 year old mother she was married uh, 6 months non consanguineous marriage and she was referred to us for a first trimester screening so whenever we do screening as i said we take the height and weight of the mother we found that the mother was only 132 centimeters in height and she gave a history of multiple fractures in childhood till 8 years of age after that she was essentially stable so uh, we did a scan scan the baby looked normal uh, we sent them for a combined screening test that showed a low risk for trisomy 21. In view of the maternal history of a short stature and multiple fractures, we advised them to go for genetic counseling at that point of time itself, but the patient declined. So uh, they said that we will uh, move on with the routine scan. We'll come back for a routine so anomaly this is scan. So this is a sort of a societal problem because having some childhood fractures and then going for a genetic counseling at this point of time because they wouldn't have revealed that information to the in-laws and the husband because on probing three generation pedigree we got out to this information but then they never realized that it is significant and suddenly during pregnancy soon after marriage we asked them to go for genetic counseling it becomes a social stigma and definitely the mother of the girl says no my girl is all right we don't have problems in our family so we don't want genetic counseling so they will decline so but then that is how it is. So they did decline, but they came back for a 18-19 week scan and uh, the ultrasound showed these findings. There was little uh, reduced mineralization of the calvarium and you can see that the bones are all very short and bent and these are actually fractures in the bones that is causing the bones to become short and bent and you have uh, overall short long bones. So at around 18 to 19 weeks, there was decreased mineralization of the calvarium, short long bones, the femur foot length ratio was very less because whenever we see a short long bones in the baby, one parameter that we do is we measure the foot length on the scan and get the femur to the foot length ratio. Because when the femur to the foot length ratio is less than around 0.8 to 0.9, then it means that it is more in favor of a skeletal dysplasia rather than isolated short long bones. So the diagnosis that we gave was a short limb skeletal dysplasia reduced mineralization was there so possibly an osteogenesis imperfecta considering the maternal history of multiple fractures but we really do not know what is the cause and uh, with this diagnosis now now we told them at least now you should go for genetic counseling we sent them to the genetic counseling unit and what did uh, what is the uh, thought process See, of the because uh, it's uh, sort of uh, early uh, showing uh, skeletal dysplasia the prognosis may not be that good for this baby and definitely the baby requires testing and we need to save some DNA for identifying the diagnosis. And the mother should be examined and evaluated. And maybe after this uh, pregnancy gets over, she has to come in the pre-pregnancy period. And she has to have some x-rays and the molecular testing if we find something in the baby. So yeah. all this was told to the couple and the fetus was subjected to autopsy. Autopsy testing. Uh, uh, so the, the autopsy was done. The fetogram and the, the histopathology of the bones were consistent with the finding of OI. Uh, they refused uh, DNA store so DNA store was not done uh, mother was examined we don't have uh, clinical photographs because they did not uh, 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 give consent for uh, photographs but then uh, typically when we see adults with osteogenesis imperfecta as a geneticist there is a typical triangular faces with blue sclera slightly prominent eyes so and some midfacial hyperplasia which was all there that is there was a phenotypic characterization of osteogenesis imperfecta in the mother and there was dentino dentinogenesis imperfecta where the enamel doesn't form well in the teeth and also there were surgical scars in the thigh uh, uh, as a telltale evidence of old fracture femur and tibia and fibula also appeared uh, short. This was the autopsy images of the baby. And autopsy definitely shows short limbs. And you can see under mineralization of all the bones. And the femur and humerus are bent. And there is a, a fracture and a reunion there. Yeah. So. And uh, coming to osteogenesis imperfecta. The old uh, Silens classification is... Uh, four types, osteogenesis imperfecta type 1, which is dominantly inherited with blue sclera, 
and then uh, the second one is the lethal uh, osteogenesis imperfecta and uh, three and four are again uh, dominantly uh, inherited with uh, normal sclera and the fourth one is uh, do dominantly or recessively inherited with progressive deformity. So this was the very old classification but now we have a uh, um, uh, array of molecular testing that is available for osteogenesis imperfecta and we have now close to 15 types of osteogenesis imperfecta and the list is still growing because of uh, errors in several of the uh, mechanisms which help in the formation of bone right from collagen and others and now the current classification is based on the inheritance and the genes so we have a non-deforming osteogenesis imperfecta perinatally, perinatally lethal progressively deforming moderate types and so this is how uh, phenotypically we classify osteogenesis imperfecta because of the several genetic mutations we have in hand. Right. So... Molecular testing, so as the mother's features were suggestive of osteogenesis imperfecta, we found out a lab in Belgium which does a research... Uh, testing for osteogenesis imperfecta because the patient couldn't pay and we found a heterozygous mutation in one of the call 1A2 gene and which is responsible for uh, osteogenesis imperfecta autosomal dominant variety and we tested her parents also and they were found negative. So the mother had a de novo osteogenesis imperfecta but now because it is autosomally dominantly inherited she has 50% chance of transmitting it to her babies in every sec subsequent pregnancies and she requires testing in all her pregnancies to detect osteogenesis genesis imperfecta and uh, uh, in the next pregnancy she came to us at 12 weeks we did a scan we also did a prenatal testing and uh, it was a uh, mutation negative and that pregnancy is now ongoing 32 weeks so again key message evaluate the mother get x-rays and then come to a conclusion prior to planning next, next pregnancy. pregnancy so we need to get the primary diagnosis before she plans a pregnancy because all the genetic testing cannot happen during the pregnancy because it takes a long time so we'll move to case 5. This was Mrs. X. Uh, she was 24 years old, married 2 years, 3rd degree consanguineous couple. And she was referred as second opinion for thanatophoric dysplasia for second opinion scan. And the pregnancy was 20 weeks and 4 days. And these were the ultrasound parameters. I just wanted to show this graph because whenever you take any measurement, don't look at the weeks. Always plot it on graphs so that you can have a visual representation to see how much the growth is. So this is where is the femur length of this baby. This is 5th centile, much below the 5th centile. At 20 weeks, the femur length is only 8 millimeter, corresponding to around 12 weeks only. So there is close to an 8 weeks lag in the femur length measurement. And what were the other ultrasound findings? Uh, the ultrasound findings showed, again, very short long bones, tetramicromelia. Very classical finding that you can see here is that this is a vertebral body. There is almost no uh, mineralization of the vertebral body. You, uh, you, you can't see the vertebral bodies at all. Very narrow thorax and uh, you can see this uh, uh, tetramicromelia and a protuberant abdomen that is there. So uh, these uh, are the uh, ultrasound findings that were that were seen and again we reported this as uh, a baby with a lethal skeletal dysplasia. And uh, the one message that I want to give is whenever we see uh, baby with short long bones and we see uh, uh, we suspecting a skeletal dysplasia there is a long checklist that you have to follow what is the checklist you got to measure all the long bones you got to measure the foot length get the femur to the foot length ratio less than 0.9 abnormal you assess the shape and contour of the long bones you look for bowing angulation fractures and then you look for the mineralization of the bones that is it's whether white or it's less whiter and you look at hands and feet look for polydactyly and uh, you look at the skull, you look for abnormal shapes of the skull, you look for the profile of the baby because sometimes you can have dysmorphic profile which can point towards a particular skeletal dysplasia. Very important, look at the vertebral bodies, you look for platyspondyly that is seen in some skeletal dysplasias and then you evaluate the environment uh, to look for hydramnios or hydrops. So any skeletal dysplasia that you see, you have an ultrasound checklist that you come that will help you to come to a particular conclusion and very important that ultrasound can predict lethality of the skeletal dysplasia in 96.8% of the cases by using a number of uh, uh, biometric parameters, the thoracic circumference, the thora femur to abdomen ratio, ribs encircling less than 70% of the thoracic level, femur foot length ratio. So there is a list of numbers that you get there and using all these uh, parameters you can know whether it is a lethal or a non-lethal skeletal dysplasia. But the key thing, that is all that we can diagnose. 
it is very difficult for us to point as to what is the kind of skeletal dysplasia that is there and for that a perinatal assessment is a must and this baby was subject to an autopsy again yes ma'am so that is uh, why i have been insisting in mediscan not to label uh, skeletal dysplasia with a name because they are always tempted to give a name so if there is under mineralization they want to label it as osteogenesis imperfecta so it could be hypophosphatasia so where the genetics is completely different so uh, uh, we have been uh, there has been huge fights between the genetics and ultrasound department because they want to prove that uh, their work is good i agree your work is good but then uh, tell that it is a lethal skeletal dysplasia and requires further work up or non lethal skeletal dysplasia and needs postnatal evaluation nothing wrong in that you have still done a good job but then postnatally if things change or you label and then they go don't have a postnatal investigation what happens they carry on with that label so if a mediscan has said previous baby with osteogenesis imperfecta in the next letter it will be saying previous baby with osteogenesis mediscan said will go away it will just remain as osteogenesis imperfecta so it will be transmitted as previous osteogenesis imperfecta without any proof so that practice should be avoided unless you have a confirmed diagnosis don't jump into giving early labels so that is very very important and uh, this is a fetus you can see that the face is a little coarse the limbs are very very short but on the x ray you can see that the skull is not at all mineralized and the whole vertebra is not ossified and the femur looks like small a block a squarish block with crenated ends and there is no bone formation there properly so this is a fetus with achondrogenesis and this is not thanatophoric dysplasia thanatophoric dysplasia you have platyspondyly and you have telephone receiver like handle like fema so that is a totally different picture whereas achondrogenesis has three types type 1a 1b and two but we won't go into the details next and there are certain distinct histological features which differentiate between 1a 1b and 2 why is this important because type 1a and 1b are autosomal recessive and uh, type 1a is dominant and type 2 1b and 2 are recessive and there are specific genes that are responsible for causing this achondrogenesis and there is a recurrence risk whereas in thanatophoric dysplasia there is going to be no recurrence risk in the subsequent pregnancy so that makes a huge difference and unless you know the diagnosis unless you know the molecular mechanisms you cannot counsel about the recurrence risk you cannot plan genetic tests and you can't counsel them accurately so that is very very important so in this patient the autopsy and the histopathology proved that the baby had a chondrogenesis now and uh, again uh, the thing is this presence in early pregnancy you can pick it up on scan at the 12th week now we have a diagnosis for the baby if we see a lethal skeletal dysplasia at the 12th week we know that it's a recurrence of the same condition so she came back to us at second pregnancy at 12 weeks the same poorly ossified sign and tetramicromelia seen now at the 12th week she came back again for a subsequent pregnancy again similar findings at the 12th week so this again was a condition which recurs in subsequent pregnancies as madam has said there is a 25% recurrence risk in subsequent pregnancies so molecular diagnosis becomes important when they want to choose alternative reproductive methods because we need a confirmation of the diagnosis Best. so we'll go to our uh, last case and this was a third degree uh, consanguineous couple and uh, they had a first child affected with thalassemia needing regular blood transfusions and they are uh, planning the next pregnancy in this scenario what would you talk to them and how would you handle them see very very important hemoglobinopathies are very very common in our part of the country and if there is a child who is presenting with thalassemia we need to go through the reports find out what is the hemoglobin electrophoresis pattern what is the peripheral smear telling us and then how is the parents carrier status like how we establish parental carrier status i'll be talking in a few minutes but then before planning a, a prenatal diagnosis we need to confirm that yes it is thalassemia and we also need to have a mutation analysis of the index child and also confirm it in the parents before venturing into prenatal diagnosis so the uh, child was uh, identified to be positive for uh, uh, compound heterozygous mutation so this is very very important see thalassemia can be independently a uh, problem uh, with the hemoglobin gene or it can be associated with several other hemoglobinopathies like sickle cell anemia or hemo- beta thalassemia can be associated with hemoglobin e disease can be there with uh, hemoglobin punjab so so many other hemoglobinopathies are there so we need to identify whether it is only beta thal 
or whether it is associated with some other hemoglobinopathy. So that is one thing. And the other thing I wanted you to uh, understand is homozygous and compound heterozygosity. Homozygosity means both mutations in the parents are the same and the child has two similar mutations which are causing the disease. Whereas if it is compound heterozygous, the father has a different mutation in the same gene, the mother has a different mutation in the same gene, but both when they come to the child can cause the disease. So when you read a report, if it is homozygous, that means both parents have the same mutation, whereas if it is compound heterozygous, that means parents have different mutations, and if both get inherited, the child will have the disease. And uh, these are uh, available in journals, so you can see the various associations of uh, the various types of uh, hemoglobinopathies along with beta thalassemia. So it is mandatory that we ascertain what type of hemoglobinopathy is there in the child and whether both parents are carriers and then confirm it by molecular testing and then plan prenatal diagnosis. Yes. Next. So uh, she planned on pregnancy and then uh, at this point of time we did a CVS in the next pregnancy. And the DNA analysis revealed that it was positive for IVS15 mutation as well as HBE mutation. And that would mean that uh, this baby is again affected. And uh, Yeah, so the, uh, the fetus is likely to have a severe phenotype of thalassemia. So they didn't want to continue the pregnancy and pregnancy was terminated. And then they came to, again to us in 2014 and uh, this time it was heterozygous and so the pregnancy was continued. The baby was a carrier. So carriers don't manifest disease in autosomal recessive conditions and they can continue the pregnancy safely. So autosomal recessive inheritance, both parents have to be carriers to transmit the disease and if uh, there is a carrier status in both the parents, there is 25% chance of having an affected baby, 50% chance of having carrier babies and 25% chance of having an absolutely normal baby, genotypically. So in, uh, go to the previous slide. Previous slide. So when you counsel an autosomal recessive uh, uh, condition, you must say that there is 25% chance of having an affected baby and 75% chances of having a normal baby in every pregnancy. And it doesn't mean that if uh, three, uh, uh, one, uh, two babies are affected, the nest is going to be normal. It doesn't happen like that. So every pregnancy has the same risk. Every pregnancy has the same chance of being normal. So the risk and the chance of being normal applies to every individual pregnancy. And uh, not like if three babies are the normal, fourth is going to get affected. It's not like that. Every baby will have a chance of being normal. Every baby will have a chance of being affected. And the risk is 25% uh, for disease, 75% for normalcy. Next. And for looking at the carrier status, there are simple uh, tests like looking at the MCV and uh, also looking at the HbA2 level. So HbA2 is going to be elevated and MCV will be low in carriers. Next. And if both parents are carriers, as I just told you, 25% chances of being affected. But if only one parent is a carrier and the other is normal, they are not going to get affected children at all. If at all, they will get carrier children and normal children. So if there is only one parent with a carrier status, no need to worry, no need to do any prenatal diagnosis. Yes. But then if the population is from high risk areas, it is always to do a pre-pregnancy MCV hemoglobin as a, a screening test. And now many people are coming for pre-marital counseling because they want to fix a consanguineous marriage. So problems like thalassemia can be ruled out by doing simple blood tests. So uh, so that's what we had. We had uh, a combination of scenarios where we had patients with uh, multiple problems in the prior pregnancies. And uh, the key messages as we had uh, given were that uh, try to do all the evaluation in the pre-pregnancy period because that's the ideal time to come to a conclusion so that we can offer the best testing for them in subsequent pregnancies. And always start evaluating from the scan at the 12th week because a good detailed anatomical scan at 12th week can pick up any of these significant problems very early and offer reproductive choices to the couple. And all genetic problems are not straightforward like thalassemia or spinal muscular atrophy where you get the genetic answers immediately. Sometimes it involves a series of complex genetic testing which involves time and money. And unless you start working up in the pre-pregnancy period, you won't be able to help them in the subsequent pregnancy. So that is very, very important. So thank you very much for a patient listening. <laughs>